Welcome to Personal Landscapes. I'm your host, Brian Murdoch. You can find links for today's episode and other conversations on books about place at ryanmurdoch.com. I'd always thought of Temur, or Tamerlane as he's known in the West, as a sort of cut-rate Genghis Khan. It was only when researching a trip to Uzbekistan that I discovered what a fascinating person he was. He was a strategist on a par with Alexander the Great, who left towering pyramids of skulls behind him, and he was also a brilliant diplomat, and a patron who valued learning and supported the arts. When he wasn't destroying cities, Temur was building them, including Samarkand, one of the wonders of the ancient Silk Road. Justin Marazzi's brilliant biography of the Conqueror was one of my top reads of 2023. He's also the author of Islamic Empires, 15 Cities That Define a Civilization, and The Way of Herodotus Travels with the Man Who Invented History. Justin joined me to talk about Temer's military genius, his architectural and cultural legacy, and how he's remembered in Uzbekistan today. I think you'll really enjoy this. So I always thought of Timur as sort of a cut-rate Genghis Khan who failed to hold his empire together uh, until I read your book. Why is he so little known in the West? I think that's a scandalous way to think of Timur. But it, you, but in a way, you're completely right. For someone who achieved what he did on the battlefield um, in terms of his enormous architectural legacy across Central Asia, all the stands and beyond... It, it's, it is kind of amazing that in the West, we don't know much about him at all. And that struck me right from the start of the project. Um, we're going back um, sort of 20 years ago or so when I, when I started researching Tamerlane. And almost always I found the most educated person would say, at best, would say something like, oh, didn't Christopher Marlowe write a play about him? And that, that, that was the best. Most people would just look, look a little blankly. And obviously, if you use the real name of Timor, complete uh, zero uh, name recognition, which I think is astounding. And and I suppose to this day, I put a lot of that down to Western parochialism. At university back in the 90s, uh, I read history, and I remember there was a course at Cambridge literally called The West and the Rest. So the, the, anything that wasn't the West was just dismissed as the rest. And I think that's a kind of legacy... Um, Oh, you know, the Tamlin should be way better known. And, and I've noticed almost in every Muslim country I've traveled in, it might be Malaysia, it might be Egypt, you talk to a taxi driver or way outside the sort of academic elite circles, everyone knows exactly who he was. That's very interesting. So before, uh, you should say how, how he got his name, Tamerlane, for those who don't know. Yeah. A team or the lame. I mean, it, 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 it's um, it's a pejorative expression used by his um, enemies. And I would actually it would regard it as a bit of a compliment, because in those days there was an expression. I think he um, something about he who wants to wear the um, scepter must be able to wield the sword. Something, something along the lines of like that. Um, I've expressed it more clumsily. But in other words, you had to be a warrior if you wanted to be a leader and a, and a king. You couldn't just sort of um, dispense your great wisdom from on high without slogging it around in the in the trenches as a great fighter. So for someone who's entirely lame in his right side, that career of martial conquest he subsequently led, I think, is ex an extraordinary tribute to his sheer determination, leadership um, qualities, ruthlessness. Um, and the lameness was confirmed when his tomb was disinterred in 1941 by that Soviet archaeologist, uh, Gerasimov. Uh, they confirmed he was quite a small man, um, not particularly tall, but I mean, it's 600 years ago, obviously. Uh, and, and, and damaged on his right side, probably from a, an early sort of skirmish. Again, his enemies just put that down to sort of sheep rustling. It may have been that or it may have been just a very early stage of his um, sort of raiding career. So, so what was the situation in Central Asia just before he comes on the scene? Uh, I think one of great uh, turbulence, instability, uh, shifting empires, shifting borders. Um, in a way, his advantage or, or disadvantage was to come from a place called Between the Rivers, this um, amazingly fertile slice of land in what is now um, Central Uz Uzbekistan, but was was more like a sort of a, a battlefield for for rival um, empires and warlords, and I think it's more a case of warlords in his immediate um, in his youth and early manhood. 
taking control of small areas of land, raiding, taking your enemy's um, belongings, women, um, cattle, as, as appropriate. But you were only successful for as long as you were, you know, you, you, you only attracted people, your army and new soldiers, for as long as you were victorious. So, again, that's another tribute to Tamerlane, that he was able to meld these um completely different tribes and ethnicities together under that one banner. Um, it wasn't because they wanted, hey, let's let's build an empire with this great leader, Timor. It wasn't like that. It was about this guy is um, pretty handy with a sword. We get, we're get we all getting richer. Um, we're getting more women. We're getting more property. We're getting more booty and treasure. We stay with him. And it just went on and on like that over a, a, an extraordinary period of something like 35 years, victorious um, on the battlefield. But you said that um, Timur's tribe, the Barlas clan, had been converted to Islam and Turkicized by the beginning of the 14th century, but that the old divisions between East and West and paganism and Islam, pastoralism, and a more settled existence remained. So how did he unify these clans and convert them into an army? I think that the, the I suppose the, 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 sh- the shortest answer to that is we don't really know. Um, the chronicles we rely on, um, especially one from uh, a court chronicle, chronicler called uh, Sharif Adin Ali Yazdi, but it is one of the most sort of, sort of sycophantic pieces of writing you'd ever come across. You know, it's just what we now would call a, a paid hack or a shell or, you know, a PR job um, about his great leadership and how he brought people together. And, and Allah was um, forever smiling on his endeavors and raised him to the top of the world. Against that, you have, um, a, a, in a way, a much more entertaining chronicle from Ibn Arabsha, a 15th century um, Syrian writer who witnessed firsthand what what Timur did to Damascus and Aleppo and turned them into sort of smoking piles of rubble. So those are the two extremes of of some early important sources. Um, But I think we can, in a way, do the math ourselves and conclude that there were tremendous powers of leadership um, incredibly astute. Some of the stories about how he outfoxed his enemies, feigning sickness, drinking a basin full of boar's blood to make himself sick in front of an envoy. So the envoy goes back saying, you know, he, he's on his last legs, he's dying. A good time to attack. Lighting fires um, all over a valley to give the impression of a vast army. Um, use of terror, actually, as an extremely effective tactic against um, his enemies, because those trademark towers of skulls he left across Central Asia, um, apart from being, you know, spectacularly atrocious and gory and ghastly, had a very important strategic fe- effect, which was to drive people into surrender on the grounds that if you do have the audacity to challenge Timor, you know what's going to happen to you and no one will be spared. And I think the ultimate was, there, there were plenty of cities that were raised. I think the ultimate kind of insult would be was even beyond that when he would sow grain, barley, over the land which he had just destroyed. Um, so I think it's a combination of of characteristics, strengths, um, the, the ruthlessness I think we shouldn't underestimate at all because in this part of the world especially, as now actually as well, if you look look at Afghanistan and what, what a, uh, the sort of martial spirit that prevails there now and how difficult difficult it is for conquerors and also people to for, for, for tribes to be brought together uh, we know that he must have had outstandingly strong leadership skills. He was able to inspire people. He was able to terrorize them, to galvanize them. Uh, you mentioned Islam as well. And I think it's it's interesting that uh, to this day, there are still debates. Was he a Sufi? Was he Sunni? Was he a bit Shia? And I think the answer was he was whatever you wanted him to be or he, he portrayed himself as at a given moment. You know, he portrayed his genealogy right down to um, Genghis Khan, as well as the Prophet Muhammad. He was a complete opportunist. Um, and I think he was a master of propaganda as well. Um, so that's rather a long-winded answer to your, your question, Ryan. But I think he, he, this is clearly a man of tremendous um, skills and, and highly intelligent as well. And to rise up as he did in, in a region like this, it's amazing how many empires rose and fell in this area. It's such a convoluted history. I have a an atlas, a historical atlas of Central Asia that I read before going to Uzbekistan, and just empire after empire, civilization swelling. It's a, it's a it's a crazy history to wrap your head around. 
Absolutely. And for, and for one man to rise out of that kind of morass of, of, of shifting loyalties, ethnicities, divisions, um, enmities, blood feud, etc., really is exceptional. And I, I tended to contrast him with um, two men who I think are obviously at the top tier with him, both Genghis Khan and Alexander. But I think in many ways, Timur was a more remarkable figure because he didn't have that ro- advantage of royal birth that Alexander the Great had from um, Philip of Macedon, and nor did he have um, a sort of single, unified, more or less um, ethnic group of people to lead the the, the Mongols in, in Genghis's case. So Timur had to really, you know, weld together what became one of the world's most powerful armies from a, a great mass of different people and that was only possible if they if they believed in you if they stuck with you um and became your army i mean this was an army that he took personally around the world um and, and was was apart from that so i think reversal in about 1370 or something against his uh one-time adversary emir hussein um he he, he was never defeated in, on the battlefield perhaps he would have been if he'd continued further east uh but he died um, on on horseback, so we will we'll never know. On on route to um, battle with the Ming Emperor, that would have been an amazing encounter. Yes, yeah, that's really amazing. So, how, how important was his tribe, the their status when when he was just in in those early days? I think um, it was important, but I don't think it was sort of important in a way that sort of set him up um, head and shoulders above his peer group. I think, from what I remember, Emir Hussein had more aristocratic blood. Um, there was a bit more lineage there on his side. Um, so I suppose he was, you know, sort of minor minor chieftain stock, that kind of thing. Uh, but he would have had to prove himself, um, com- you know, almost entirely. Th- that was was nowhere near enough to to explain almost anything that, that, that came after his birth, 1336. Well, clearly his, his uh, genius as a military commander came out quite early. Like one of the stories you give in the book, he... You talked about an encounter he had um, where his soldiers lit hundreds of campfires on the hills around uh, the much larger forces of his enemy to give to give mitts and they were surrounded. And then when the enemy fled, he had his men fasten leafy branches to the sides of their saddles and give give a huge pile of clouds of dust, you know, as they gave chase to, to give the impression of an army on the move. It was really clever. I think those touches are, are fantastic as well, and you know they're the, they're the little gems that you come you you, you glean from some of the accounts. Um, I, again, I think that probably comes from Yazdi, um, who was sort of um, well, obviously very keen to show Timur's military genius. But I think there's no there's no reason to disbelieve those sorts of things. That that extreme cunning, um, which we have to admire, and and not just because as a as a gimmick or or just a little anecdote, but but clearly this sort of stuff worked um and because he used it throughout his, his career i think as he became more powerful and you know started operating on a, on an imperial scale you don't hear quite so much about that but what you do hear about is how many towers of um severed heads he raises up around baghdad for example um i think it was something like 96 towers or something with huge numbers of severed heads that, and that, that are then set alight so give us a description of that what would this look like um, I think, well, for, for a start, it would look like nothing we, we have ever seen in our lives. I, and I think it would be a, 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 one of the most disgusting things one could ever see. You know, th- these would be, th- those people who might have been left in a city or something and are suddenly surrounded by these towers. These are their, their kinsmen, women, possibly children. Um, the skulls are piled up into um, towers, mounds or towers. I'm looking at one now as we speak from a Persian miniature and Timur sitting on a carpet and his soldiers are coming towards him, each carrying one or two heads. And you can sort of see the bloody neck and there are there are severed um, decapitated corpses on the on the ground in front of him. And in the background, there is um, one of these towers. Uh, they were then set alight, but oil covered all over them or you know poured all over them and then set alight. So... They were literally beacons, but beacons of human flesh. So I think they would have been one of the most dreadful sights um, that one could imagine. And they became his signature as well. So I think probably we can extrapolate from that that, um, you know, when news travel fast, messengers were on horseback, um, crisscrossing um, Central Asia and beyond at this time. 
um, these stories would have been told with dread by messengers to, to uh, other kings and princes and emirs and khans. Um, this is what happens if you do not strike a deal with this man. So, you know, th there's there's heavy incentives um, to treat with him. Or unless you're extremely confident that, you you know, you can best him on the field of battle, which as the decades went by from from 1370, really, which is the outset of his career when he takes Herat, um, the odds would have looked more and more against you. And there's that sort of alphabet of cities, Antioch, Aleppo, through to Damascus, Balkh, and on and on. These cities, that, that those that do resist, they, they share a common fate, um, some worse than others. So Aleppo and Damascus, particularly bad. Um, and, and the stories of um, prisoners being cemented live into towers. I think that's Isfizar in Iran. Um, these sort of atrocities committed on a really monumental scale but i think they they are part of the 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 the, the military strategy the battle plan um the way to instill terror into your adversaries because it's much easier to, to take a city if you don't even have to fight or lose a life on one of your soldiers suddenly you have a really rich city in front of you um full of treasures um and all you've done is sort of you've marched your army up to a, a mile or two within the city walls or something so i think it, you know this stuff worked it's appalling, um, but it was a very different world in the in 14th century Central Asia, of course. Have there been traces of this found? Like, has has anybody uncovered these these pyramids of skulls, or do you do you find these just in written sources? I, I I'm not aware of these sorts of things having been found. I think that what one, what I did have a look at in Kyrgyzstan, which was I found fascinating, was um, a, a huge um, mound. I mean, in in Scotland we'd call it a cairn, but it wasn't. It was much more than that. Supposedly, the story was that each um, soldier put a, as they left to go, this is right at the end of Timor's reign in, in I think, uh, towards 1405. As they headed east towards uh, China, they they piled a, a rock onto this growing thing, which became an enormous sort of mini mountain. And then when they got, those who got back, um, you re removed it. So basically, the, the ones that the, what is there today are the, are the numbers of men lost, which is a small mountain of very large stones. I mischievously took one from the cairn and, and put another one in its place. But who knows? That might have been from one of Timur's uh, soldiers in, from the uh, the early 15th century. But I, in terms of skulls, um, I've never seen any stories about that. That that would be fascinating. And you think perhaps they could they could. There could be traces, but in I suppose in a place like Baghdad as well, which has just seen so much turmoil and and also urban sprawl over the centuries, that I, it would probably be quite difficult. So, was this, this habit of raising cities was that something he he got from Genghis Khan? How much inspiration did he take from the the strategies of his predecessors a hundred years before? I guess right. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think I I I think that this is a man who we feel from what we read about him in those early sources is very keenly aware of his place in history. And Genghis is, is mentioned from time to time. Um, we know that he wanted to, to portray himself as a, as a sort of a, a, a successor and linked by blood to, to Genghis and Alexander is mentioned as well. And we know there was, a, there was the instance when, when justifying his um, expedition across the Hindu Kush to, Sack Delhi in 1396, two-year campaign. He there's there's an explicit mention that um, Alexander didn't go that far south. Hmm. So he's he he's beat he's trying to beat these these great conquerors of old. I think raising cities was um, yes a, a Genghis a Genghis um, signature as well. Um, whether he did that only because of Genghis, I I would I probably question. I think this is a, a fairly sort of common thing when you when you're overwhelmingly stronger and you're able to do that uh but yes i think i think we can see him as operating consciously in the tradition of genghis which i think also gives him um greater legitimacy in the eyes of his followers as well this is someone who who does come from um i would say very questionable because it's not really true but that he's coming not that long after genghis he has that scorn for the settled life. Um, it's slightly tempered because he does build cities as well. The scorn for cities and, and this sort of reverence for the nomadic way of life. But he also 
makes an exception in the case of Samarkand, which he turns into one of the great cities, the Pearl of the East, one of the great cities of the world. But even then, there are sort of, he's building, you know, there are these all the fabulous tents everywhere as well. It's not just sort of monuments. It's it's someone who is still operating in that fine Central Asian nomadic tradition, the hardy warrior who typically has nothing but scorn for the weaker farming sedentary types who are, who are there to have conquered and exploited um, and killed. I, I'll, I want to come back to that in a second, but also one other thing in reference to Genghis Khan, you said that um, once he'd created his massive armies, he had to keep it occupied to stop it from fragmenting into uh, squabbling tribal factions. So uh, was this the same for Timur? And was it a sense of a strong center of leadership would weaken all these small, smaller chiefs that he would want to gather underneath him? So uh, delivering a constant um, stream of loot was was sort of the price that these smaller chieftains paid for giving their loyalty to him. So kind of a recompense for their continued support. Is that how it works? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, because if we look at the those 35 years, 1370 to 1405, almost always the army is on the move. Of, of course, there are seasons, um, as there would be now in Afghanistan, as we hear on the news when you're talking about Russia, Ukraine, and things going quiet in the winter, simply because of the conditions, things are frozen, mountain passes are inaccessible, etc. And in in Timur's case, um, his army is often rested in the pastures of the Caucasus. Um, but for those 35 years, the armies are continually on the move on different expeditions i think with the one exception i forget the exact years there are two years in samarkand and then he just throws himself into a frenetic building campaign to make um samarkand look incredibly magnificent and and we know that in that strange case that some buildings were built too quickly the foundations weren't sunk you know deep enough some buildings collapsed um, and he was sort of, you know, killing um, architects and builders, throwing meat at them into the foundations, you know, treating them like his sort of servants, which they were. Um, but with the exception of those two years in Samarkand, his armies were on the move. So I, 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 I think that's completely right that the, you know, this was not an era of having standing armies. They were as loyal for as long as it was, it was worth their while to be loyal. Um we also hear in the sources how lots of people switch sides in the run-up to battle. We, we tend to hear ones where they are joining Timor's army rather than leaving. I suspect that in, in, in practice there might have been a bit more two-way traffic than that. But because this was the man to beat, this was the most powerful guy, um, d d d irrespective of what tribe or ethnicity you came from, if you switch sides you know, just before battle, was commenced you're 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 more likely to be on the winning side if if you're you're you know beneath Timor's banners than than his adversaries and i just think there's there's an perhaps we can trace parallels today with um if you think about Saddam Hussein's last um decades the qu questioning the war in in the wars he waged in some ways misses the point the point was to stay in power it doesn't matter about your your losses or in in, in the mind of some like Saddam you're you're hanging on to power that's the most important thing you remain president of iraq and i think we could probably say the same of putin today um you by just remaining on a on a on a war footing you are boosting your chances of of remaining in power netanyahu as well even you know keep the war going you you're less likely to face a challenge um but in tamalane's case it's backed up by victory after victory after victory um and this is sort of like a, a Pax Timor across, across well beyond Central Asia, right, right across to the shores of Europe, really. When when he um, beats um, Sultan Bayezid in 1402, the Battle of Ankara, that that's that's an amazing moment. And and suddenly you, you see all these um, sycophantic European kings and princes congratulating him and terrified that he's going to continue going further west because they wouldn't have been able to oppose him, and he's just not interested. Yeah, that, that's something we should mention too. Actually, the um, to put listeners on a more familiar timeline, the situation in Europe at this point was what a bunch of squabbling backwater um, feudal states, famine and plague, and and bickering clerics. There were two popes at this time: one in Rome and one in Avignon. That's that's a hilarious term, right? Eh? Antipope. Like I always figured, the antipope. I always figured, uh, <laughs> why didn't they just cancel each other out, like matter and antimatter? But I guess I guess at one point they had a third as well. 
So there, there was really nothing in, in, in Europe worth taking. No, exactly that. Um, they're all terrified um, with their sort of sycophantic letters praising the most serene Prince Timor for getting rid of Bayezid, which, by the way, um, was was beneficial for them as well, you know, to, to, to get rid of the, the, great, the great Ottoman Muslim adversary on the on the shores, uh, on, on the eastern borders of Europe. Um, and as a result, um, they, were, they, were, they, they bought them sort of 50 more years of, of, of peace. Um, but they were, of course, they were terrified because they would have had no way of opposing this this absolutely menacing, formidable force uh, from the east. Um, and he voted with his feet. He didn't press on further west because it was simply not worth his while, as you say. Sort of almost Europe as a provincial backwater, small cities, um, muddy, lacking in treasure, divided, uh, weak. Um, you know, power power was in the east at this point. Um, and and that is where he continued to look once he'd, he'd um, subdued the Ottoman um, Empire in its early days, admittedly. Um, the next great adversary was in the Far East, um, and we'll never know what, what might have happened. But um, he was guided by where where was the loot, where was the treasure. That's why he, he took his army across that incredibly difficult route, um, the Hindu Kush, um, on horseback. And he was an old man at this point as well. And there are the stories of how he was lowered up and down um, precipices. Extraordinary story. The logistical feat. Um, it's a magnificent logistical achievement there, really. Um, but that, that that is because Delhi is waiting for him with centuries of accumulated treasure, which which disappear within a few days. And um, the chronicles are very clear about that. This this accumulated wealth just is is taken by this um ferocious um islamic warlord and and europe had nothing like that 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 was of 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 interest to timor i suppose that's one reason why he's he's not better known because people like you and i who who would have uh, had history courses that that just focus uh, solely on europe we think we think of it as the center of the world i don't think it's a generally well known that the center of the world was elsewhere throughout that entire period central asia the importance of central asia the Islamic world, which you write about in Islamic empires as well. And that was the center of everything, wealth, riches, and intellectual learning. I think that's completely right. We 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 have this um, Eurocentric view, or many of us in the West. Um, I suppose there's, there's, there's the ancient um, history there as well, ancient Roman Greece, classical civilization, and then, you know, industrial revolution almost. But, but for much of the time in between, the great powers are are nothing to do with Europe at all. They're 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 in the part of the world that we're looking at, and and um, in the Middle East and uh, further east as well. And Tamlin is at the heart of that, you know, absolutely, a, a name that should really be much more widely known um, than than it, than it is today. You know, it, it 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 it's a sign of Western ignorance that, that the best people can do is say, oh, didn't Christopher Marlowe write a play about him? That is not fact. <laughs> You know that's nonsense. That's that's sixteenth century playwright. Um, anyway, I mean it's a great play and it's full of blood and gore. But um, he, he, I've always thought he he deserves a far wider or audience. Of course he does. I was such a much more interesting figure than than I'd ever imagined before I before I read your book. So we we talked a lot about his cruelty and his military genius, but even his bitter enemies were in agreement about his personal qualities. You say that he was fearless, a consummate diplomat, highly attuned to deceit and subterfuge, but he was also generous and courteous. He loved justice. He esteemed learning and he supported the arts. It's not, it's not what you would picture. You wouldn't picture Genghis Khan in that way. No, you wouldn't. And I've always felt that one of the great differences, actually, between those two men as well, um, although Genghis was, you know, the sort of nomad's nomad and, and, and Timor hails from that nomadic tradition, the, the, the warrior on horseback with ma- mounted archers, feigned flight as a battle te- 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 technique and so on. There, there are many similarities between the two men. But Tamlin also had a great respect, I think, for what we would maybe today call the built environment, um, monuments as a demonstration of, of someone's power. Um, and, and there's that great line, you know, if you doubt our strength, look at our, our buildings, you know, look at the, um, the these blue ribbed uh, domes on the mosques and minarets, mausoleum, madrasa throughout Central Asia. 
they 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 testify to my power my civilization um my duty for obedience to allah as a muslim and so on and so forth um and the blue representing the heavens so yeah there's that there's that there's that very strong i think civilizational achievement which i think historians will will fully recognize and, and hence the the moniker the timurid period um but it's a fairly short lived empire we have to say um it, it does that classical thing of um disintegrating after his death and you have the feuding princes and sons so it is relatively short lived and i suspect that is also part of the the reason he's not better known um all of the genghisid empire as well doesn't last forever either but i think yeah i've always thought it was it's strange you know, we know genghis we know alexander tamerlane is 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 the mystery man in the west and um i i, I think he you know he shouldn't be one of the things i found interesting about the your descriptions of his character is that some of them come from people who had every reason to hate him and even they had to grudgingly admit what a remarkable person he was those those excerpts were really really interesting to read yeah i think ibn arabshir is one of those as well and a man who absolutely despised um timor and, and it's um yeah you could hardly ignore that or fail to observe it when you see the, the chapter titles calling him a demon a satan a vengeful dog all, all these sort of incredibly florid uh expressions but yeah he has to admit um the man's qualities because how else could he have turned the world upside down without being in, in superior um to the kings and monarchs of the region you know otherwise it just it, it doesn't make sense so that yeah there, there's that kind of grudging respect um he's sort of some sort of hellish invader but he he gets stuff done and he is actually a brilliant diplomat as well um there's some fascinating exchanges of letters between him and Bayezid in the run up to that that fateful encounter and again i think for me that showed you it was it was the the the, the fatal danger of underestimating him don't just think that here is some sort of barbarian from the east he he's much more than that and if you underestimate him you you you're more likely than not to be destroyed as by as it was i think by as it had a certain sort of um ottoman arrogance about him and you know we're we're from a superior culture who the hell are you 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 you're no one i'm 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 from a you know a dynasty royal blood etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that didn't didn't serve him very well in in in, in the end so to put one final stamp on his um his military achievements you said that the quickest way to understand uh, him and the scale of this achievement is to consider a map of his, his campaigns so a map of his empire shows a giant ink stain spreading across 1.7 million square miles of central asia the caucasus asia minor the levant and swaths of the indian subcontinent so we've we've got you know deserts mountains uh, empires right to the gates of europe the turkish coast Siberia to the outskirts of Moscow in the north to Delhi in the south it's it's unbelievable span of territory I'm just looking at it now Ryan in the back of the book and it is, it is extraordinary and it is particularly extraordinary when you consider this has not been handed down to him you know this is a guy from a a, a valley plain in the heart of of today's Uzbekistan and that giant ink stain we're talking about goes right up exactly right up to Moscow down to Delhi cross into Egypt and the shores of um the Bosphorus uh, one man with his sword who starts out pretty ignominiously as a sheep stealer a rustler he, he he's he's not born in a palace he's not he doesn't sort of inherit 20,000 soldiers he he his first exploits we know are with small numbers of men pinching cattle from the neighboring valley and, it, and it, that's what that's how it starts and i think that is is that contrast between the two the beginning and the end that make his military achievements so so spectacular um for me it doesn't really matter so much that it, it all fell apart because we're just looking at one man's career the legacy is something different i think but that that career to to achieve that within such a short space of time is extraordinary i was surprised at how many times he um he conquered georgia and tbilisi and it's just it's like they just didn't they were very stubborn he just kept coming back over and over and over again i was in tbilisi last year and i, I wish i'd read your book before i went there <laughs> i was in tbilisi last year as well and poor old georgians as you say they they're the sort of the 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 whipping boys for for timor again and again he just rides through them and 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 
and and sacks it with with great ferocity this this christian kingdom and interestingly i think it's one of those fewer places if you look at the the, the map of his conquests that is a christian kingdom he's always talking about being this great jihadist but more often than not his adversaries are muslims timur's military career is muslim on muslim he's shedding muslim blood virtually wherever he goes and georgia is, is one of the exceptions to that and perhaps that's what animated him it's where he could really kind of go to town with the slaughter and raise the banner of jihad in a much more plausible and legitimate way than when he's fighting fellow muslims of course i mean these things are um you know it, he he had very pragmatic understanding of jihad as well which was if you're fighting a fellow muslim it's because they, they've left the true faith they're not they're not true muslims anymore and and, and you can see that today with uh isis daesh al-qaeda etc we're fighting you because you're not a real Muslim. You've departed from the true faith. And so Tap Tamerlane used the, the, the same argument. But yeah, he's, um, his name, I think, lives on. We talk about his lack of name recognition in the West. He doesn't have that problem in, in Georgia, in Tbilisi. Yeah. He's regarded with, with great dread and loathing. So how important was the Sunni-Shia split at that time in terms of a justification for some of those campaigns? I, I think any, any sort of religious discussion in, in the context of Timor and his battles, I think we take with a pinch of salt. Um, I think he likes to see himself as kind of undisputed leader of the, the Muslim world. So, you know, if, if, that, if, if that requires you to be a Sunni, he's a Sunni. But I think there are genuine interests in a more Sufi mystical tradition as well. Um, I think that's clear from the sources. But I think religion... It is it's kind of a banner for him to to raise and unfurl when it suits him. Um, there there are one or two debates we hear about. Um, he meets Ibn Khaldun, I think, is it on the in the walls around the walls of Damascus? Um, but he's more, he seems to be more interested, from what we tell, in history um, and the stories of other conquerors and what they've achieved and where and how than in religion per se. I think this is a man who, who whose mission is to conquer, to slaughter when needed, um, to style himself as this great Islamic leader and warlord, the warrior of the faith, the sword arm of Islam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But th these are honorifics. Um, he, is, of course, he's a Muslim, uh, but there's that sort of slightly more pragmatic Central Asian background that he's inherited from Genghis as well, as opposed to coming from the. What, we want, refer to as the Islamic heartlands, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Arab countries, where where from you know where Islam saw its its earliest um, flowering. So you've said for in terms of his empire, he do he drew on two parallel structures to run this. There was the Turk the Turco Mongolian system of government with um, hereditary official positions, and the Persian bureaucracy of the settled lands to the west. So the the Turco Mongolians they took charge of courts and military affairs, and the Persian bureaucrats um, were in charge of financial matters like tax collection. What implications did that have for his empire survival? This this strange amalgam. Well, from what we can tell, I think Ryan, um, it was extremely successful. Um, there are various stories, you know. I don't think they're apocryphal. Um, Rui Gonzalez de Clavillo, the Spanish ambassador, who is virtually kind of pursuing Tamerlane because Tamerlane is heading east, and he's and Clavio, the Spanish ambassador uh, from the court of Castile, is, is trying to have his audience with Tamerlane. So he he kind of he he, he rides across the empire or, or much of it, and the story is one of peace throughout the place. There are all organized um, postal systems, uh, coaching inns. Um, the country is at peace. People are paying their taxes. There's a sort of sense of order and and discipline and rigor. Um, I suppose that is the the, the yasa, the Mongol traditional uh, laws and customs that that you you referred to are, are a part of the equation. It's, it's that amalgam. Um, but I think also that the, the this is an empire being run to enable. Timor to fund future wars as well. Um, it, it's it's a sort of an extractive um, empire. Cities are subdued. They're frequently subdued again because they they need to be, or they might have risen up. You know, I don't think we th this this is like an imperial administration a la Rome or or, or anything like that. It's much lighter touch with with, with occasional 
outbursts of extreme, you know, retribution to to a city that has kind of popped its head above the radar and said we don't want to pay our taxes anymore or anything like that. So it's kind of minimal administration, um, maximum retribution, and you you know you keep putting your money into the, into the coffers or will will destroy you. So he's ruling over a settled state, and I think also there there had to be that pragmatism of. Uh, more quote unquote civilized nations, especially Iran, which has those deep traditions of um, administration and rules, um, legal systems, and and so on and so forth. That that is a much more sort of complicated imperial administration than than from Timor's uh, part of Central Asia further to the um, east. So as as you just mentioned, it wasn't all destruction, like, and this that's what most surprised me about your book. I think that we're Genghis Khan is remembered um, for his destructive powers. Timur built astonishing cities of tiled mosques and mausoleums and, and verdant parks, and he and he filled them with scholars and craftsmen. But did he ever really settle himself? Like it seemed like he himself was always he was building these cities, but he was living in tents and always on campaign. Even when he was in Samarkand, he moved from park to park. Yeah, that 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 is a lovely detail, really, isn't it? Even when he's back at home, quote unquote home, um, he's still moving within the city. Um, he's inspecting the the buildings that are being raised according to his command. Um, I mean, you and I use the word tents because, and, and that will probably strike a false note to what they, they actually look like. These are extraordinary, elaborate, um, and by all accounts, extremely comfortable um, dwellings. You know, fur-lined, um, banqueting tables, rugs, carpets, cushions, jewels everywhere. Um, I mean, gl- Clavijo, the the Spanish ambassador, his account is tremendous because you feel that with each step he takes further east from Spain, his sort of European prejudices about, you know, who is this barbarian I'm meant to meet are shifting very quickly to, oh, my goodness, this is this is sort of one of the most powerful men in the world, clearly. And when he finally meets him, he's kind of overwhelmed with the grandeur, the splendor of it all, all the retainers the wives, the princesses, and so on. Um, maybe a tent, but it's it, it's it probably maybe more of a pavilion, we could call it that instead, perhaps. But yeah, there is that, that nomadic um instinct tendency never never quite goes away. He's always he's always on the move. Um and that it's an interesting tension between the sort of the settled life of cities, which as you say he he builds, um, but the life of the mounted warrior on, you know, on horseback. Um and in a way, it's kind of never really resolved. He, 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 you know, he does both. So let's talk about Samarkand, the, a city that you also included in your more recent book, Islamic Empires. Um, we should first say where it is for people who don't know. Yes, it is in the heart of Uzbekistan. Um, Tashkent is, is today's capital. Bukhara is the other great city of Uzbekistan, historically speaking. Uh, Bukhara was his uh, religious capital. I think he called it the Dome of Islam. Um, to this day, it is a still magnificent historical city. Samarkand, though, was his capital, uh, Pearl of the East, and really, um, going back to the sort of the, the relationship between that city and his conquests, the, the 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 loot and treasure of the world that Timur sacked and conquered for thirty five years was brought back to embellish this this imperial city of his. I mean, Samarkand was already famous. Um, Samar- Marakanda from ancient history. Um, and I think it's a suitable capital for him because it has that historical lineage, but he kind of takes it to what we today would say the next level, meaning he just turns it into one of the greatest cities on the planet. But it, it's only that's only possible because he's looted much of, of, of planet Earth as well, brought the treasures back, including human capital as well, we should, we should say. The scholars, the priests, the writers, the calligraphers, the artisans, the metal workers, the poets, the dancers, and so on. So there is that respect for culture, uh, maybe entirely selfish and self-serving because it's to make his capital look um, numero uno, but but that is what he achieves. So that, that that's the city we're talking about here, the Pearl of the East. It's interesting, too, that there was an element of um, he, he was so conscious of those who came before him, like Genghis Khan had sacked Samarkand, Alexander the Great took it. And it ha- held a special place for Timur as well, because that was his first major conquest, I guess. But that that same sense of, you know, one, one-upping the guys who came before him. 
Absolutely, yeah. They're, they're, again, we, we'll you know refer to that that very self conscious tradition in which he's operating in the footsteps of 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 those conquerors, Alexander and Genghis. Here's here am here am I. All these centuries later, I'm in that same bracket. Make no mistake, I'm 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 a world conqueror, and this is my capital. And I think he probably you know Samarkand under Timur. That really is its its golden era, um, culturally, architecturally. Economically, so give us a sense of, of what it would have looked like at that time as as he's building these structures. Well, you can get a, quite a good sense even today. I mean, I think from for my money now, Samarkand has been kind of over over restored, Disneyfied. And it's not fair, maybe to say Disneyfied because the, the Soviets um, were responsible for a lot of that um, style of restoration as well. But in a in a sort of less less um, negative perspective possibly you could say that you know by restoring those blue domes everywhere you have that sense of the interplay between the, the the flashing light of a strong asian sun on those bright blue glazed um mosaic tiles so the the the, the bright blue we call it aquamarine or azure that is typically on the dome so that it is designed deliberately to re- reflect the sun so it would be a very sort of light filled flashing city with incredibly beautiful um, mosaic decoration on all these buildings as well, enormous uh, facades, portals. Um, the great um, square in, in Samarkand, which Curzon described, the Registan, Curzon described as the most noble public square that he'd ever seen in the world. This, this 19th century English statesman who was very clear in his mind, which was the superior civilization on earth, he was he was sort of blown away by the Registan. Um, so I think. Today, part of that was built after his death, by the way, which is the, the, again the Timurid legacy. But these these very oversized buildings, they make you feel small. You 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 cower almost under the minarets and the and the entrance portals. So as built environments go, I think it had that that very strong effect of sort of overawing you, as it did the Spanish ambassador. Um, Streets everywhere with grand imperial buildings, mausoleum, madrasa. Um, but we're seeing them as historical, slightly crumbling, romantic ruins with grasses growing out of the cracks between the tiles and things. They would have been brand new then. So this is it's a sort of strange version of, you know, Dubai meets Doha or something in a strong Islamic context, but with an architectural tradition that is entirely indigenous not they're not they're not flying in french skyscraper designers um european or north american uh urban planners this is central asian um architecture by central asians and it spreads across the region as well you know I- I- iran um you know look at a blue dome today uh wherever it may be in that part of the world and and there's a, there's a direct link to timor timor's um architectural legacy so it, for me it was one of the more fascinating contrasts uh to that incredibly hideous career of slaughter on the battlefield and cruelty on a sort of almost a maniacal scale but with purpose but um you know that 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 on the on the sort of the ledger the the the, the plus and minus the empire building at great cost of you know human bloodshed spilled around um various continents but that that architectural legacy, I'm not, and I'm not saying one compensates for the other either. But I'm just saying, it, for me, it makes him a more rounded, historically interesting uh, figure. That's quite a distinctive shape as well. Those ribbed domes, but you, yeah, they they really, you really can spot them. Like they, they're like nothing else. They're hard to describe, aren't they? I mean, that's why they're called ribs because I mean, there are different styles, of course, as well. I'm just looking at one now, detail from a blue rib dome, and the the sort of interplay between the dark blue and the the azure. The minarets as well, um, absolutely beautiful examples of his uh, Islamic art from the the 14th century and the 15th. You know, it, uh, after his death, that that tradition continues. Um, some of the madrasas in Samarkand, the Tilia Kari Madrasa. I'm looking at a picture of that now with that very ornate Mukana stalactite interior design. You sort of the, the light and gold um, leaf tumbling down the insides of these buildings. I mean, very serene, uh, regal, dignified, imperial, um, and his own uh, mausoleum where he's buried in, in the heart of Samarkand. A very, actually, slightly smaller scale than some of the other monuments in the city, but but very stately, serene, a place of great beauty and and, and peace. 
um, and, and really, you know, an appropriate place for the conqueror of the world to be buried in the heart of his capital. You've said that before, Tim, a few buildings apart from smaller scale funerary monuments were so lavishly embellished, but from the later 14th century, this sort of lavish tile work became the norm. Yeah, that, and that, that monumental um, scale of some of these buildings, I mean, we should probably stress that m- most of these are public buildings. Um, these are not sort of private palati- palatial residences. They're, they're mosques which pay tribute to the, the, the great creator, Allah. Uh, they're madrasas and they're religious colleges, which, again, are, you know, um, educating a new generation of religious scholars uh, to write their treaties on Islamic law, to become preachers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, their mausolea, where where illustrious Muslims are buried, um, so these all uh, pay tribute to the uh, the sort of is- Islamic tradition, but they're also new in becoming a sort of you know a Central Asian monumental architectural style, which which um, spreads you know in, in its very sort of glorious way. So you mentioned the human capital that he seized um, uh, on his travels and on his conquests. So he captured scientists and scholars, you know, writers and philosophers, and and brought them all back to um, staff these new academies and libraries that he built. Well, why was that important to him? First of all, this intellectual uh, legacy. It's interesting because you see his willingness to shed blood um, so often in the chronicles. You know, the the, the, the men and women are um, captured, often slaughtered in cold blood. Um, possibly they've been prom- they've they've, they've um, agreed to surrender in return for their lives to be spared. He reneges on those promises and they're slaughtered. Sometimes they're they're ridden over by horses in his army. But more often than not, a, a consistent theme is his um, sparing of the scholars, the religious um, elite, the writers, the poets, the calligraphers. I think some of that probably you could say is fairly hard headed in that. I want these people to come back to make Samarkand look pretty and magnificent. The, the metal workers from India, um, the wood carvers, whatever the different special specialities um, are that may be from his from his conquests. But I think it, it does also, I think, um, testify to his his interest in his respect for um, scholarship. I mean, I think m- meeting Ibn Khaldun is it, it's just a snapshot. It's 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 a man he wanted to meet. Um, he wasn't just trying to find the, the 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 prince or the or the king or the monarch he's just conquered because he has complete contempt for them. But a scholar is someone I think he respects, is interested in, and he I think he also wants to kind of test them and say, you know, what what made Genghis so great, or you know, am I outstripping Alexander in my conquests? That there's a sort of self interest as well. But I think a genuine interest in um, the intellectual life. Yeah, you've got a really nice quote in the book here who, that uh, to give a sense of, of what Samarkand was like at this time. You say it's one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Um, among the Muslim population, there were Turks, Arabs, and Moors, the Christians represented by Greek Orthodox, Armenians, Catholics, Jacobites, Nestorians, joined in lifelong servitude by Hindus and Zoroastrians. Jewish weavers and dyers were an important community, together with their co-religionists in Bukhara, um, with a population of around 150,000. It's you describe it as a melting pot of languages, religions, and colors, which I think would make it so different from many other cities. I'm not. I'm not saying that other cities in the region weren't mixed. Of course they were, but I don't think to this scale, um, and that that includes the the prison prisoner population or the or, or the or the or people who have been enslaved and put into forced labor like those um christians from asia minor the um the victims or the or the or the prisoners from the 1402 uh, battle of ankara um as well so that is is for me is inherently interesting that that mixed population and it, and in a in a later book when i was uh, researching baghdad that came across very strongly the, the cities in their golden ages are, are truly mixed and cosmopolitan and that gives them their sort of strength and and power as well um so but th- this is sort of forced movement of population as well so I'm, I'm not i'm trying not to romanticize this he's he's brought on these people from all over the world but but yeah to create this amazing melting pot of of different cultures which seems to work i mean 
it, it may not work if you're uh, enslaved and your your job is to sort of make uh, you know metal pots every day but but in terms of the city and what what is created as a result um it, it it's a very powerful statement of, of, of power and um you know ar- architectural glory you said that plunder beautified Samarkand and brought these intellectual riches to it, but you pointed out that peaceful trade was the bedrock of his empire's prosperity. These trade routes that that pass through here and keeping them flowing, keeping the goods flowing. Yeah, and I, I so I think that the the you know we know that he needs um, he needs revenues to keep fighting wars. Um, there's, there's there's plunder as well, but there needs to be trade, both internal and external, and that's why that that the enforced peace across the empire is so important to him and there is that sense of of trade generally flourishing under his his um heavy well i should say his heavy rule it's not heavy in terms of his um direct administration trade trade flourishes things go wrong when when cities or leaders maybe a local prince decides that you know he's he's giving too much money away to timor and he maybe they can go out alone and that's when the sort of the full force of the administration, you know, comes down on you like a ton of bricks. But in the absence of that, um, we know from the accounts that um, trade was was important to him. He he knew that 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 was one of the lifebloods, or, or perhaps the main lifeblood of, of a flourishing empire. Um, so people can crisscross the um, his lands um, without being plundered. You know, there there is an enforced peace, and that that is beneficial for trade. Trade and trading conditions and merchants. So you've said that Timur was the rarest of political and military leaders, an amalgam of scorched earth conqueror and strategic empire builder. The Islamic world has never seen anything like it and never would again. And yet within a hundred years of his death, the empire he built ceased to exist. So why did it fall apart? Well, I think the, um, I, I don't want to be thought of now as trying to absolve him from, from, from you know, mistakes after the graveyard. But I think one of the classic things is clearly when you've got several sons um, all wanting to take over, you have the recipe for um, div- division immediately. And, and the Ottomans had to contend with this for centuries. I was talking about this um, actually last night with a, with a friend and um, he was saying, you know, was it always the, 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 the prince nearest Istanbul who got the crown? It wasn't always, but if you were furthest from um, Istanbul, your chances were going to be pretty slim. Um, and then all the other brothers, more likely than not, would be slaughtered as well by the by the guy who has taken over the throne. So the Ottomans, which, you know, incredibly successful empire over many centuries, faced these same problems. Uh, Timur's case, um, I, I think the other, the other the re- related to the, the, the number of princes who are squab- squabbling for the throne is that uh, their, their qualities. Was any of them um, as tough? as ambitious, as disciplined, as rigorous and ruthless as Timor, I would say almost certainly not. Um, some were more sort of effete and soft. Some were cruder. Um, and the moment, he, you know, he warned his children, you know, you must remain united or the empire will fall apart. And I think, you know, human nature kicks in at that point. They scrabble for the throne. Um, it lasts for a while. Um, there are some sort of cultural high points. Ulu- the astronomer king, um, a man of great refinement and intellectual curiosity. Um, but I think, you know, it's that classic thing um, which was described also by Ibn Khaldun, that that, that cycle of, of barbarians coming in from the desert, sacking a settled city, then becoming refined and soft themselves, and then they in turn are taken away by the barbarians. Um, I think he was the self-made man. Um, the princes had, had led pretty gilded lives. And ultimately, they were they were swept away in in time as well. So, what was his most enduring cultural legacy? Was it Samarkand? Was it the architecture? I think the legacy of Samarkand must rate pretty high up there, really. Um, but I think for me, that it's, it's that legacy, even if it's a little bit or, or very intangible in the West, it's that record of um, empire building. Imperial conquest, um, sab- strategic use of savagery, um, and that 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 one man empire builder story. Um, I think everything else, you know, adds to the the myth, the legend, the, his interest in um, architectural glory, 
his interest in um, the intellectual record, in scholars and so on, his posing as a this great Islamic leader and jihadist. But ultimately for me, I think he, it's that um, unrivaled really military record on the battlefield, which, which just sets him apart from everyone else. What, what, an, what a completely extraordinary figure. Mm. I suppose there, he did leave one other indirect uh, legacy, which was the Mughal Empire in India. Yes, which 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 then lasts until you know the the mid nineteenth century. That 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 then no, that's that's a, that is a very good point because um, we focus really on the the Timurid Empire, which is obviously is, is much shorter lived. Um, but the um, you know Babur and and the Mughals go, go on into the nineteenth century with that that tradition of princely Mughal Islamic rule um, in a really a world away from. Central Asia as well. I'm, I'm just thinking of Babur's letters back home and how much he missed um, Arbol and Central Asia with, with that stifling heat on the Indian plain. Um, there's that sort of romantic wistfulness about having left the the, the high mountains of Afghanistan. Um, Tamlin was much more of a sort of you know raid and leave type of guy. He he wasn't going to stay stay there. He he looted in um, Delhi um, and northern India got what he wanted and and, and le- left you know in quick order but yes as you say the um the, those seeds of the the mogul dynasty very long last so under the soviets timur was seen as as um, potentially a dangerous and destabilizing symbol of um, uzbek nationalism and he was kind of banished from public discourse or, or written off as a barbarian and a and a destroyer but he experienced the resurgence after the fall of the soviet union it's kind of resurrected from the dustbin of Soviet history. Was this just official propaganda? Like, how widely was this? Is this embraced? Do you think in Uzbekistan? Well, from the from the Uzbeks I spoke to, um, there was enormous uh, skepticism about this. Really, I think because not least because the, the man who who led this was uh, President Islam Karimov, a man who boiled dissidents alive, um, a man who whose name will probably remain in infamy in the sort of human rights annals of our time. Who used Timor really as yes this sort of symbol of newly independent Uzbekistan on the highest denomination of banknotes and um, a new museum and, and, and an awful lot of nonsense we should say as well that was written about him Timor was this Timor was that um, there was just something very crude and forced about it in a very old fashioned Soviet way top down autocratic and, and ultimately from from a dictator I mean it was interesting to me because I was then researching um, this biography of, of Tamerlane to see him having, as you say, been consigned uh, to darkness under the Soviets as someone who mustn't be revered in any way because, um, you know, that goes against Soviet orthodoxy. We don't want any you know, regional nationalisms breaking out. But I don't think it had huge amounts of... Um, I don't think it was sort of received necessarily with open arms by everyone, because at, at that time as well, Uzbeks were, were languishing under an incredibly oppressive um, dictatorship. Mm-hmm. But the only evidence I saw of it really was um, people posing for wedding photos next to Timur's statue. So that's that's still happening. Yes, yeah, yeah. and that, I like that actually. Yeah, it's the sort of slight feeling of you know father of the nation sitting on this great throne on the top of a fairly high um series of steps hmm. that that that's nice to hear that tradition is is, is still maintained that's just an uh, astonishing number of weddings actually as well kiva was i think the where i saw them the most because it's such a compact uh, inner city and they, yes. they do this the same circuit everybody and sometimes the groups would kind of bump up against each other because the ones before are going too slow and the weddings are almost queuing up, aren't they? Yes, it's, it's um, continuous. It's amazing. You photograph by these various, you know, monuments, and, and especially the one of Timor. And I'm hoping that Timor is still on horseback in the heart of Samarkand. Is he still? Yes, still there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's a pretty nice thing to have in your, you know, in the heart of your capital. There aren't many countries around the world, if any, that can have someone like that in the in their main squares. You know, this was our this was our biggest uh, military leader. What about yours? Who have you got? You know, we've got Lord Nelson in Trafalgar Square. Yeah. Now, as, as fine a naval figure as he undoubtedly was, uh, Lord Nelson was no Tamerlane. 
Such a remarkable figure. So I want to I want to close by kind of broadening out and asking you a couple of questions. One that you brought up actually uh, that have to do with Islamic empires. This is something I asked Barnaby as well when we talked about the house divided. Uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago how the great cities that you wrote about they arose under dynamic leaders who kind of made them bastions of tolerance and harmonious coexistence, quite cosmopolitan places. But as they declined, they became increasingly conservative and homogenous in terms of the people who lived there and, and more and more intolerant of other faiths. So is intolerance a symptom of decline or is it a cause of it? Like does weakness and loss of power cause people to turn inwards in this way and become retreat back to a, an earlier version of beliefs or is, or, or what does one cause the other? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it, and it's, it's, um, it's a very difficult one to answer as well, because, when I was um, researching Baghdad for several years alone, just just, just one city, it, it, it struck me repeatedly throughout the book that the city in its strongest um, period was very multi-faith, multi-ethnic, uh, very cosmopolitan. And in its low points, including while I was there, you know, in, from 2004 onwards, you literally were getting um, concrete T-walls going up between Sunni and Shia neighbourhoods. And Iraqis saying to you, you Americans and Brits have created the Sunni Shia differences. We They weren't there before. And I said, well, of course, we didn't invent them. But this invasion has clearly, um, you know, made exploded them into into great, you know, in terrible uh, bloodshed and division. Um, but I think the exact interplay between which is the symptom and which is the cause. Nowadays, you have to say London is an incredibly cosmopolitan city. Many people also feel it is becoming less tolerant. Mm. Uh, some people will say, actually, that's not true at all. Look at the Brexit vote. London was virtually a different country. It did not vote and does not vote according to the rest of the UK because it is so cosmopolitan and mixed. So I think it's really difficult to say. I think there is a, there is, there is a relationship between those two things, tolerance and intolerance, and the cosmopolitan, you know, multi-diverse population. But it, exactly which comes first? Um, does the decline set in because it's intolerant or is is it only intolerant after the decline? I think it's really difficult to say. Um, I think as well, some of the modern cities in the Middle East, like Dubai and Doha, are fairly cosmopolitan themselves. Um, they're in more or less autocratic regimes as well. Um, tolerance only goes so far. I mean, I've, you know, people generally say Dubai is a pretty tolerant place. It's not that tolerant if you stand up in the middle of this one of the squares and start complaining about the royal family or you are gay or you want to kiss someone in public you know th th there's tolerance and there's tolerance right mm -hmm. so i think sometimes um these are complicated issues I, but i think you know the cities are these great civilizing places literally you know civitas a, a citizen of a, of a city um and we go from Tamerlane's time to today. The successful cities, I think, still remain those that are that are of very mixed populations. Um, besides being obviously much more culturally interesting as well, mm. you know. How interesting is Mecca as a city? I suspect a lot less than, and I'll never know because I'm not allowed to go there, which is itself a, 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 a sign of some sort of intolerance because you only allowed to go there if you're Muslim. Contrast that with Istanbul, great Muslim capital, formerly obviously the capital of the Byzantine Empire, but an, a, a bustling, magnificent, life-filled, frenetic, dirty, magnificent, glorious city. Mm. Um, and I know it's one I, I would rather visit. Yes. So in terms of my final question, in terms of governance in, in Islamic empires, you say the Dar al-Islam reached its pinnacle when absolute monarchy was the norm in the West. And while democracy steadily took root in Europe from the 19th century, the Islamic world of the Middle East never made a similar transition, despite stuttering efforts by ambitious modernizers in Cairo and Istanbul, Beirut and Tehran in the 18th and 19th centuries. A crisis of governance remains at the heart of the region's agonies. Is there a solution to this crisis of governance? And is it democracy or is it something else? Yeah, that's a great question, Ryan. And it's, it, again, another difficult one. I think probably re, re, you, when you reread that to me, I also feel that we should probably have said, or I should have said, um, West, repeated Western intervention is is, is mm. a huge part of the as well. 
um, or Western supported, whether that's um, Israel, Gaza, whether what happened in Iraq 2003, Afghanistan for the last 20 years. Uh, you know, we as I mean, not not we, we, but the, the, the West has repeatedly intervened in these countries. Um, interestingly, I think the interventions now are much broader. I read, read a, a very interesting new book, um, 10 Conflicts in the Middle East, which makes it an unusual point that in the um, around the sort of the pre-war, pre-Second World War, your average intervention in the Middle East had two intervening powers. Now it's six. six. So if you look at Libya, the number of countries intervening in Libya and Syria is much greater now like three times the the number of countries that used to intervene. And that's that poses enormous problems for these countries. I mean, Afghanistan is uh, serially intervened against by, you know, Pakistan, Iran, the West, UAE, Saudi Arabia. It's so complicated. Um, But but at the same time, I, I wouldn't retreat from that view about the crisis of governance. Is democracy the answer? That's also interesting because democracy seems to be in retreat um, or under great pressure. Um, I've just read the um, the latest issue of The Atlantic, which is devoted to a Trump second presidency. And although that might be in some ways overdrawn, it, it does give great concern for the, the future of the world's most powerful democracy and how easy these things are to undermine or subvert. But I just think the governance in in so much of the Middle East now, Egypt under Sisi, it's a, it's a, a sort of a police state on steroids. Much of the Gulf, um, keep your head down, it, everything will be fine. But if you don't keep your head down, you can be locked away or you can be eliminated. Um, in my mind, not a great way to run a country in the 21st century. Um, but you know these aren't my decisions. And um, yet another Western view on the, on the Middle East is probably not considered very helpful these days. Uh, I think the great losers in many cases are the citizens of these countries. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's clear that these attempts to impose an outside system of governance that we think works for everybody should work. This this idea that um, everybody will just embrace liberalism if you get the monarchs or the tyrants out of the way has been an utter failure everywhere. Terrible example in Iraq in 2003 onwards. Um, I can't remember the name of the book. It's Inside the Emerald City or something like that. Um, about these sort of neocon um, zealots who flooded Baghdad, um, and they were sort of downloading Maryland traffic regulations to to, to uh, stock market regulations on Iraq, and Iraq was a playground for for neocon ideas. And uh, let's be frank, how well did that work? Just so uh, completely naive. Was, uh, so much of it. There was no Al Qaeda in Iraq before we went in in two thousand and three. Uh, we just we were its greatest recruiting sergeant. Yeah, we're certainly living interesting times. Well, I guess we should wrap it up here. So thank you for your time today, Justin. I, I knew nothing about this fascinating man until I read your book, Tamerlane, Sword of Islam, Conqueror of the World. And it's it's just impossible to put down. Fascinating, highly recommended. That's really kind. Thank you very much, Ron. And it's been a great pleasure to talk to you about this um, incredibly unusual, brilliant man again. Thanks for listening to this episode of Personal Landscapes. If you like the podcast, please give it a rating on iTunes and subscribe through your favorite app. You can find links to today's podcast and more conversations on Books About Place at ryanbernard.com. You'll also find a donate button if you'd like to contribute to the costs of the show. All donations are greatly appreciated. Thank you.